In this week's Motor Week, Ginny Buckley drives the latest Volkswagen Golf, Richard Hammond tries two very hot hatches, and Ken Gibson is in the high-tech Nissan Skyline. Since it first appeared on our shores back in the late 70s, VW's Golf GTI has won a firm place in many a heart. It's a fantastic all-round motor. It looks the part, you know it's going to last, it's practical, but above all, it's always been fantastic fun to drive. The Mark 1 Golf GTI was closely based on the standard Golf. An excellent, if slightly boring car. But an uprated suspension, a 1.6 litre fuel injected engine and sports trim turned it into a pocket rocket. During its lifetime, the Mark 1 changed very little, apart from the addition of a 1.8 engine that was carried over to the Mark 2. Now this model had got a little bit chunky around the midriff. But hey, don't we all as the years go by? But apart from that, all the important bits that made the Golf GTI so popular were retained. the Mark II does show its age a little bit. There's no power steering, of course you don't get ABS as standard, and believe me, the ride is extremely harsh compared to modern cars. But despite all of that, it is fantastic fun to drive. But because of its age, it means that there are some positive points. The engine hasn't been strangled by that catalytic converter. The steering feels very direct, you get plenty of feedback and you know exactly what the tyres are up to. And the harsh ride does make you feel like you're going very fast indeed. This is the perfect car if you're young and you don't mind roughing it just a little bit. That shoe, then you will have an absolute ball. Unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end, so we waved goodbye to Mark II and we said hello to a rather different Mark III version. This time around, it seems those Volkswagen engineers have gone all middle-aged. You may get an extra rotund body with the Mark III version and you get more refinement and room inside, but at what cost? Well, you feel it in the handling. There's a two litre engine in this version and it's got the same brake as the Mark II, but you really don't feel it. You've got to work it and keep the revs right up high to get the most out of the power. But having said that, in this version, you get a good all round car and you are getting the GTI badge for not much extra cost. Then there were four, or should that be five? Because alongside the conventional Mark IV GTI, there's now, heaven forbid, a diesel version as well. that diesels and the GTI legend should really be kept apart but give this car a bit of a chance. In terms of ride and handling it feels no different to the Mark IV petrol GTI but where the engine's concerned it's a completely different ball game. For a start there's an awful lot more torque and it comes in much lower down the engine range. Now in many modern cars you really have to work the engine, you've got to get the revs up high, drop down the gears to get any power out of it. That's not the case with the TDI. You get an instant power surge just when you need it. And out of corners, there's very little that can keep up with it. Believe me, it's fantastic fun. OK, I've got to admit, there is a bit of rattle and roll when you first start up. And at low speeds, it does sound a teeny bit like a bus. But let's get on to the subject of economy. This car will get you from A to B as fast as a petrol GTI version. But believe me, it will cost you an awful lot less.
The new Golf GT TDI PB has 115 brake horsepower, an increased load and torque, a six-speed gearbox and all the sports trim you'd expect on a GTI. And it's all very impressive. VW's Golf GTI is a perfect example of evolution. But which version is the best? Well, that's an impossible question to answer because each of them offers something very different. If I was 19 again, well, I'd want the hard ride and the excitement of the Mark II version. But I'm not. And these days, I like my creature comforts. And for that reason, I'm surprising even myself because I'd have to plump for that very talky diesel. The Peugeot 206 GTI, the latest of the breed from the past masters of the hot hatch genre. And if heritage is anything to go by, then this should be just about the best you can buy. But what if you want an alternative to a mainstream GTI? Something a little bit different, something that will stand out from the crowd. Uh, well, be warned, it's a Proton. I know, pork pie hats on the parcel shelf and an old Mitsubishi engine clattering away up front. So to make up for its perhaps rather down market sounding badge, they've fitted it with two badges. And the second badge says Lotus, which isn't that surprising really when you consider that Proton own Lotus. So they've let the British sports car supremos loose on fettling their GTI. But have they done enough to challenge what Peugeot at least will tell you is still the original, the grand master, the benchmark of hot hatchery? It may well be able to trace its line directly back to one of the original small hot hatches, but the 206 GTI feels about as big as the factory that they built the original 205 in. But that said, once you are in here, it's a, a very nicely understated cabin. It does feel very well designed. There's lots of nice touches. I do like the sporty little instrument binnacle and the little chrome gear lever. So why, oh why do we have a reappearance of this awful textured plastic? It looks cheap and feels nasty and tacky. I do like the suede effect and leather though. Very sporty. I can remember the first time I saw a 205 GTI 1.9 and I was amazed that there could be an engine so big in a car so small. Well, today's top spec GTI from Persia now boasts a 2 litre engine and it'll dash from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 8.4 seconds. The ride is soft and comfortable and the controls are very light and easy to use. But hang on, this is a hot hatch. The old 205 felt like a go-kart. This begins to feel perhaps a little too grown up. The light steering could be seen to be remote and rather distant. Whereas in the 205 you felt every bump and ripple in the road through the controls, the brakes in particular on the 206, though very effective, could be operated by somebody else's feet. Overall, the 206 GTI comfy, oh yes, very, too comfy, well, possibly for some. And the price for all this comfort, well, today's hot hatch is a long way from yesterday's, not only in size of the car, but also the bill, £14,000. You've got to admit, when you look across at the Proton, it is a bit of a surprise to discover that it is a Proton. And there's another surprise inside as well. OK, so it's a little bit garish, perhaps, but come on, this is a GTI. It's a hot hatch, that's what we want. If you want subtle and understated, go buy a Rover. If sporty little touches are your thing, though, this has got to be the place to be. It's got every single styling cue you could find on a hot hatch. Chrome gear knob, little chrome bolts and rivets everywhere, little chrome pedals down here by my muddy feet, and these spectacularly comfortable Recaro seats. Now this is more like it. Less powerful the Proton may be, with only 1800cc to the 206's 2 litre. And though on paper it is faster, it'll dash from 0 to 60 in 7.8 seconds, I'm not convinced. But if it's the experience we're after, then this really will bring out the hooligan in you. For a start, the Proton is loud, very loud, most of it through road noise. The steering is fast and direct with plenty of feel, and the same can be said for the brakes. Once you discover that most of the power is actually in a narrow mid-range band, then it's very easy to exploit it. 
It might be less luxurious than the 206, but those ultra comfortable seats provide just the support you need on a longer journey. Mind you, if you are about to tackle a longer journey in the Proton GTI, be warned to keep an eye on the fuel gauge. It's got a range of about 25 miles, so you'll be hopping in and out of those seats a lot. It's not because the Proton is thirsty, it's just because the tank is tiny. If you're waiting for me now to tell you that the Proton costs four and a half grand less than the Peugeot, don't, because it doesn't. It actually costs 500 pounds more. And it's a mark of how far Proton have come as a manufacturer, that their hot hatch can be compared to Peugeot's without it being laughable. Even more so that it can cost more than the Peugeot and still be taken seriously. Cynics might tell you that it's also a mark of what's happened to Peugeot, that their hot hatch can be compared to any Proton at all. In fact, the 206 is as large, as comfortable and sophisticated as you could possibly want from a car in its class. The baby Proton is loud, brash and raucous in every inch a hot hatch in the traditional sense. And if you're still having a little bit of a snigger, here's one further little bit of food for thought. Think about this, the Talbot Horizon and the Cortina. Pretty humdrum cars, neither of them worth peanuts second hand until Lotus became involved. Then, hey ho, instant classic. Who knows? Coming up after the break, the Nissan Skyline on Motor Week. Now here is a piece of history. Here's something that you can track back to the war, wartime necessity, right up to the hulking great 4 before 4s that come from Japan now and that we can see taking kids to school all over the world. Back then in the war, the need was there for a lightweight, general purpose vehicle. General purpose, GP, that's where the name Jeep came from. The necessity was that it had to be able to be carried by four blokes, and it can be, there's handles to prove it. It had to be as agricultural and as basic as you could possibly make a car. And it is. And that's how the whole shape came about, the high mud guards. There's no curve on the mud guards. Every single part of it is as simple to make and to repair as is humanly possible. But of course that shape became an icon, really that influenced subsequent off-roaders through generations and generations and generations. And it all started here, the Willis Jeep. The answer to that need, and it's fantastic. Now, a friend of mine had one of these, and it's a nightmare. 55 miles an hour is absolutely the most you can possibly expect, and uh, keeping it going in a straight line is going to be next to impossible. But what an important, influential vehicle. Apart from its role in the war, the cars that followed on from this, in their millions, it's great. And also, you can do this. I've always wanted to do this. Ah, ah, whoop. Well, you know. That's it, really. Where does it come from, this strange urge that overwhelms otherwise sensible middle-class people to take to the streets aboard huge pieces of Americana built for a place entirely alien to us? This is not America. America is a place where fuel is cheaper than water and the only corner your car is required to negotiate in a journey of a thousand miles is the one into the sweeping driveway in front of your mock Georgian mansion. So this fixation must be some sort of madness, surely. Well, one car from over there that's doing really rather well over here is this from Chrysler Jeep, the Grand Cherokee. Grand meaning big, and boy is it. Now this ain't no namby-pamby soft roader. This is actually a very capable all-terrain vehicle. Oh yes sir, eh? And if its rugged good looks aren't enough to convince you of that, then a quick glance down the spec sheet will do. In this, the limited edition Grand Cherokee, it would be shorter to make a list of things that you don't get. And I can't think of any. Air conditioning, electric seats and a 10 CD auto changer are to be found scattered around the very comfortable cabin. But let's face it, that's about as much as its off-road features will ever be. Just a selling point, facts and figures on a spec sheet. Something to boast about to the other ladies and chaps who lunch down at the tennis club. Maybe 
it's a power thing, the desire to take control and dominate what is undeniably a very big beastie indeed. And I don't just mean the bulk and size of the thing physically. The engine, a 4.7 litre V8. It'll go from 0 to 60 miles an hour in around eight seconds. That's madness. The closest thing I can think of is it must be like those poor people whose bungalows are undermined by subsidence and drop off the edge of a cliff. Sitting in a bungalow falling off the edge of a cliff as it hits terminal velocity probably feels a bit like flooring this thing. So to driving the thing? Well, it's an off-roader, so taut and pinned to the tarmac is not on the menu. Nevertheless, it's not as rock and roll as you might think. There's quite a surprising amount of body control. It's perhaps only let down by the rather chunky hybrid off-road, on-road tyres, but you don't feel like you're about to bounce off the first corner and up the nearest tree. Of course, it's not all image for image's sake. There are a few really practical points here. There's no doubting the car's ability to get you out of trouble should you indulge in any kind of off-road excursion. But there's also tons and tons of room. The boot's plenty big enough, unlike its smaller sibling, the Cherokee, which is, well, a little challenged in the load space area. There's also plenty of space in the cabin and no shortage of creature comforts either. Should you ever need to tow anything as ghastly as a caravan, you can, several probably. OK, sure. So most owners probably never will romp across the field in their Grand Cherokee like a V8 gas-guzzling four-wheel drive version of The Hills Are Alive to the sound of music. It's a lifestyle thing like muesli and wearing running shoes in everyday life. So most Cherokees will never actually have their off-road abilities tested to the limit. Fine, four befores don't. Then neither do coupes. Find me a coupe or a sports car that is ever legally anyway fully taken to the limit of its abilities. No, it's more about comfort and practicality and something that's a bit different. As long as there are people who are prepared to pay that bit extra for something that does stuff they might not need, but looks good, there'll be cars like the Grand Cherokee. Now, off-road, on-road. Off-road, on-road. It is very bumpy off-road. I think we'll go on-road. Just this once. Now this has to be the ideal parking spot for a Nissan Skyline, a helicopter pad. Because this is as near as you're going to get to being airborne on four wheels. The Skyline is an absolute flying machine. This car is a petrol head's dream. It's macho with a big, big capital M. Everywhere you look on it, it's got huge spoilers, side sills. The wheel arches are massive, but then they need to be. We're talking about 18 inch wheels here. It's got Brembo brakes on it. When you put the foot on those, it's like dropping an anchor. Everywhere it looks, it looks muscle. It looks as if it's powerful and dangerous. And then you finally come back to the old aeronautical touch, this huge rear spoiler that looks as if it could fit very happily onto the back of a Boeing 747. But actually it's rather practical because this mechanism here helps keep the stability down and actually keep you back on the ground. Here we've got about five or six horses. Inside of here, we've got 277 horses. Sadly, no car is perfect, and if this wonderful Nissan has one failing, it's the interior. It doesn't feel or look like a 54 grand car. A lot of it is standard stock. The only difference is this Nintendo-like machine with all of the information on the screen. Floor the accelerator in this machine, and it's like liftoff at Cape Canaveral. It's absolutely superb. Mind you, it's no bloody surprise, really. 0 to 60 takes just 4.5 seconds. 0 to 100 will take you 10.5 if you really put your foot down. And that is just amazing performance. It's got more technology underneath here than you've got in your average computer center. There's multi-link suspension, front and back. 
there's a computer controlled four wheel drive system that controls the car so well that, to be honest, you're not quite sure whether the computer's driving the car or you're driving it. The great news is though, you feel absolutely wonderful. Driving this, I feel as if I'm Michael Schumacher. Cornering is like going around on rails. This is about as near as you can get to driving a rally car. The ride is rock hard. You feel every bump as you go along the road, but it just adds to the adrenaline rush. It is just such a buzz. This is untrue. I feel like some young kid again. It is just sensational. This is the fastest drive I've ever had in my life. Top speed's limited to 155 miles an hour, which is actually probably a good idea because you can lose your license in this car very easily just going from naught to 100. Whatever your favorite ride in a theme park has been, forget about it because the skyline gives you your very own everyday theme park. After a burst in this, you'll never ever want to go to Blackpool or Alton Towers again. Down in the supercar jungle, there's an all new king. And that's the Nissan GTR. Forget all about your Ferraris, your Porsches. They're as common as muck. And when it comes to sheer speed and brute force, this big baby will leave them standing. On next week's Motor Week, Elisa Portelli drives the new Seat Toledo V5. And Ginny Buckley tries out the latest from Toyota, the MR2.